Okay, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. It's my uh, pleasure uh, this afternoon to introduce our grand round speaker, Dr. Alan Hamilton. Uh, Dr. Hamilton has a number of appointments uh, at the University of Arizona. Uh, he's a tenured professor in the Department of Surgery in the Division of Neurosurgery. He is the executive director of the Arizona Surgical Technology and Education Center, known as Aztec, uh, and that's part of the College of Medicine. And he's also a clinical professor uh, in the Department of Radiation Oncology. On main campus, he holds the titles of professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and also professor in the Department of Psychology. Dr. Hamilton's training includes a neurosurgical residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital and also a neurology and neurosurgery research fellowship with the National Institutes of Mental Health or of, of Institutes of Health. He has served as a national and international consultant on a number of scientific committees and advisory boards, as well as being on the editorial board or a reviewer for a number of professional journals. Dr. Hamilton's scholarly works include a number of referee journal articles, book chapters, and monographs. Last year, his book entitled The Scalpel and the Soul, Encounters with Surgery, the Supernatural, and the Healing Power of Hope was published by Tarcher and Penguin Books. This book has been featured in a number of announcements at the Arizona Health Sciences Center and also in the media, and many of you may be familiar with it. His CV lists over 200 national and international presentations on a wide variety of topics. This afternoon, Dr. Hamilton will be discussing the human mirror neuron systems, the neural and anatomical basis of compassion and empathy. Dr. Hamilton. Well, I, uh, good afternoon. I have to give credit for this uh, talk actually to another grand rounds that took place in integrative medicine. Um, and uh, I was interested in one of their speakers was talking about uh, this notion of, uh, of compassion and brought up the topic of the mirror neuron system. And uh, it, it, it sort of at, uh, inspired me to go back and take a look at a number of things uh, from a neuroanatomic basis. And I thought uh, I might share them with you, but I'd like to start off with uh, this uh, painting. Um, many of you may recognize this painting. This is uh, Las Meninas from Velázquez, uh, hangs in the Prada uh, Museum. And uh, this is one of uh, probably five or ten of the most famous paintings in the world. And there's a reason this painting is, uh, is so famous. Um, and I'd like to sort of walk you through it because I hope it'll set the tone for uh, what interests me about the human mirror neuron system. So uh, let's just start off with, and I've been cautioned that I'm not supposed to use this pointer because we're being televised. Now, I've always been kind of a contrarian. So as soon as you tell me not to do something, I'm going to do it. So in, in fair warning, I'm going to say to the audience that is watching this over the network um, that uh, they won't see where the pointer's pointing, but that is the benefit of actually being here physically present in the room as opposed to watching this over the internet. Um, so what I'll do <clears throat> excuse me, is I'll start off with the pointer just to be nice. And what I want you to picture for a moment is this instant, almost like a snapshot, where we're walking in, and if you look at the detail a little bit in this painting, I've removed the print, I want you to notice that um, first, this is La Infanta, the infant, the princess, uh, to the crown, and she is surrounded by her attendants where the name comes, Las Meninas. And you'll notice it was very common in court for dwarfs to be uh, servants in attendance. So we have this scene here where everybody's head sort of in a diff slightly different position. Here's where it pays to be physically present. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the, the princess herself is halfway through turning. Her eyes are already fixed on whatever the subject is. You can see that the, uh, the dwarf uh, attendant has already firmly and squarely fixed on whoever's coming in to view. This other attendant, who's actually in the process of offering the princess a glass of water, has not seen yet who's on the scene. Here behind, you can see there's actually the chaperone, the nun. She's still busy in conversation, but the bodyguard has already noticed 
And then here we have Velasquez himself, who has popped out from behind his canvas to see what is going on. So my question to you is, who is the subject of this canvas? Is it nominally Las Meninas, the attendants, and the princess, or is it somebody else? And if it is, who is it? So the first thing I want you to uh, look at is, um, let me see if I can do this. First, you can see here, by the way, over in the corner here is her brother, who certainly is uh, not taking notice of anybody and is taking time to kick the dog. But if you look in the background, you'll see this kind of ghostly image here in the mirror. And I want to take you back to a little bit farther perspective in a moment, but again, I'm going to raise this question. Who is the subject of this painting? Because we have this sense that everybody has stopped in mid-gaze and is looking at somebody who's just come on the scene. And who is that somebody? Well, if we look at this servant, we see this servant over here is already in the process of curtsying, implying that she is about to bow to whoever's come into the room. Um, if you look in this painting, could this be whoever's come into the room? Well, we know that represented in this mirror is actually the king and queen of Spain, who are the patrons of Velázquez. Are they the subject of this painting? Have the king and queen actually come into the room just then, and everybody's in the process of acknowledging them? Well, is that the case, or in fact, are they the painting subject, and are we seeing the subject, what Velázquez has been working on, reflected in the mirror? Now, Velázquez, there's a little interesting point about Velázquez, and that is, if you notice, he has a red cross over his heart. Legend has it that um, he was so loved by the king of Spain that after Velázquez passed away, that the king himself came back in the middle of the night and painted this red cross over Velázquez on the painting to indicate his love for Velázquez. But this was actually painted by the King of Spain. So we have this peculiar interplay between who's the object of the painting and who's the subject of the painting. And when we look at it from a distance, where does our eye go? Where's the natural focus of your eye go in this painting? It goes to this shadowy figure standing in the hallway in the background. And who's this shadowy figure? It's actually Velázquez's uncle who encouraged him at the court and was his patron at the royal court. So this painting stands out as a profound masterpiece of not really understanding completely whether we're the object of the painting or the subject of the painting. Is the viewer most important or is the object being viewed most important? And I love this interplay between being both the observer and the observed. So let me talk a little bit about uh, mirror neuron systems and the implications that I believe that the mirror neuron system has to the whole process of self-awareness. And like most great discoveries, um, the mirror neuron system starts back in the early 1990s at the University of Parma. And there were two researchers there um, a gentleman named uh, uh, Ikebini and another man named Rissolati who were doing some research on the motor neuron, uh, the primary motor neuron system of primates. And like all great discoveries, uh, things sometimes happen more by accident. Here's how their setup worked. They started off with a co motor cortex of a primate a monkey model. And what they did is they put in a grid of electrodes and they were just recording the electrical activity of these large motor neurons. And this is what it might look like if you saw a lot of firing and spiking from the individual cells, and this would be a summary of that electrical activity, not uh, particularly uh, difficult to understand. And here is a typical recording. Uh, they would put a peanut out on a little tray, and the monkey would reach for the peanut, as they were fond of peanuts, and they would record the motor firing of the uh, neurons. Now, um, 
As luck would have it, one of these experiments ran a little bit late in the morning. And remember, we're in Italy, and it's lunchtime, and we've got to take a break for lunch. And so the technician in the laboratory said, I don't have enough time. What I'm going to do is I will go to lunch, but in order to save that extra time, I will leave the monkey hooked up and ready to go as soon as I get back from lunch in the afternoon. And the technician blazed through lunch, but saw that it was getting time to get back to the lab and brought with him his gelato dessert back to the lab. Unbeknownst to him, the monkey is still hooked up and recording. And when he looked, what he saw was that there was firing being recorded in the neurons when the monkey was watching him lick his ice cream cone. Now, if you think about that, that makes absolutely no sense. Why would motor neurons in a primate's motor cortex fire when it's watching somebody else lick an ice cream cone? But it's the ice cream cone to which we owe the discovery of the, motor neuron, the uh, mirror neuron system. So here's what happened. I already showed you what would happen if the monkey reached out for the peanut. But what they found out was that there were certain neurons which would fire in exactly the same pattern whether the monkey reached for the peanut or the monkey watched the researcher reach for the peanut. In other words, as far as the brain was concerned, it was mirroring the activity that it would have performed had it really been carrying the act out. And here's what the imaging of the motor neuron activity would look like, one over here when they're actually reaching for the peanut and one over here when they're looking for the peanut. Now, what's interesting about this is it really doesn't matter if they even see the peanut being reached for. The same thing will happen if they hear somebody opening a peanut. The same thing will happen if they learn to tear a piece of paper or they hear a soundtrack of a piece of paper being torn. So that led to this interesting phenomenon. There are neurons that fire when they watch when you watch when the subject watches somebody else move. Now, what could that be for? And again, as I said, it doesn't matter whether you're actually just, you're seeing the peanuts being reached for or you're actually hearing them just being cracked. Now, this austere gentleman over here is Vernon Mountcastle. Now, Vernon Mountcastle became famous because he discovered these large motor neurons and Little did he dream that there was a whole second new system of large motor neurons whose only purpose seems to be, as far as we could tell, to mirror motor activity. Now I'm going to give you a very, very quick rundown on the anatomy. Um, and normally if this was a lay audience, I'd say there'd be a test at the end. But if I say that, there'll be so much test anxiety in this audience that I just can't stand it. So I'll just tell you, if we were to cut along this strip of the brain where you see the red section, you would see this um, coronal section. And as most of you know, um, the area in red is what we call somatosensory cortex. And as you may recall, the brain is actually laid out in a homunculus, which looks like this. Now, I want to make a point about the homunculus that I always make with the resonance, and that is the homunculus is not set out the way we would logically set out the human body. In other words, we see the foot here towards the midline, and then we basically see very little trunk, very magnified hand, then a discontiguous break, and then we go over to the face and the mouth, and then a discontiguous break again where we go over to the larynx and the tongue. And the area of proportion of somatosensory cortex to some extent is related to the importance of the value of that cortex. And if you were to translate this into a physical representation of the body, we would look something like this to our brains. So one of the things that was interesting is, what's the connection of this mirror neuron system to this primary somatosensory system? And here you're looking at a picture of an acupuncturist putting in a needle into the web space between the fingers. Now, if we were to actually image somebody's cortex with a functional MRI while they're watching this, this is what it will look like. What you'll see here is the needles are going in the left hand, 
So there's this large amount of firing in the mirror neuron systems over here. You'll see this little bit of firing off here on the other side. What's that? That's how the brain sort of tells right versus left. But what you're actually seeing is the area of the brain in a very similar location topographically lighting up as if it's actually experiencing the puncture from this acupuncture needle placement. One of the interesting things about when we look at these empathetic responses is that some people have large responses when we image them and other people have smaller. And this is a study in which they actually looked in an area of the brain that I'm going to come back and talk about in a moment called the anterior cingulate area. And what they did is they averaged the large responders over here on one side, and you can see a large amount of activation there in the anterior cingulate. And then there's some very low responders. So what we see is that some people seem to be inherently more sensitive, if you will. They show more imaging activity than others. And I'll come back to that as well. So here's our little model of the uh, mirror neuron system. So we're going to start off with uh, um, these different areas. So let me start off first. Uh, here we have the ventral premotor cortex, and the ventral premotor cortex is where you plan out emotion. So if I am reaching out to touch you, to reach your hand, I've actually already thought out that entire motion. It's already organized in my premotor area before my motor cortex fires. Then you have this rostral inferior parietal lobule, which is sort of a, uh, a cross section, if you will, of sensory pathways. And over here you have cerebellum, which is this ancient, almost reptilian cortex that's involved with uh, coordinating musculature, but also our emotional responses, the, um, the motor response that we have emotionally to things. And I'll sort of review this real quick. Here's two other areas I want you to be familiar with. This anterior cingulate area, which is sort of the emotional side of things, and then this mesioorbital frontal lobe, which is the analytic cognitive side of things. And I'm going to go run through this with you uh, in a little bit. Let's first go to the posterior superior temporal sulcus. This is a primary area, and what we see is that we can get um, auditory input, we get a lot of visual association, and then we also get sensory input into this junction uh, area. Then you have the uh, rostral inferior parietal, and its job is mainly to coordinate signals coming in directly from the somatosensory cortex itself. This ventral premotor cortex, which I told you, is where movement is organized and uh, integrated. The cerebellum, which as you know, coordinates muscle movement, but it's also involved in the spontaneity of movement. So let me give you um, a, an example. When, um, you know how most of us hate to have our picture taken? You know, everybody says, you know, everybody, one, two, three, cheese, and you just have this, and whenever you look at your picture, it's, you're always the most lame per person in that entire photograph, and you always say, I never take a good picture. And then somebody captures you at a moment when you're not looking, when you're really interacting with people, and you look so natural, and there's a reason for this. When I'm interacting with somebody and I'm laughing spontaneously, my smile is a very different smile than the one when you say one, two, three, cheese. The smile that's spontaneous is actually coordinated through the cerebellum. It's ancient reptilian emotional response. So it's very spontaneous. It's almost like you don't process it. Okay, it just happens. As opposed to everybody smile, that's all coming from the, pre, the ventral premotor area. And that's your cognitive, willful, attempt at trying to replicate that spontaneous smile. And that's why the two smiles always look different when you look at them on a picture. Uh, let's see. Anterior cingulate area, emotional input. I'll review it in a moment. And mesioorbital frontal lobe, this is where you put the brakes on everything. This is where you process and uh, you're kind of going not so fast, okay? So here we look at, got a picture of a polar bear. And we all feel this sort of emotional pull when we see this picture. Now, let me just diagram for you what's been going on inside your brain. Here you go. We start off with the visual area, polar bear picture. You put that in through the posterior superior temporal sulcus. Auditory, there was one ooh, very quiet ooh in the audience, okay? Then you take your sensory, you go over here to your ventral premotor area. You're starting to think about uttering the 
ooh sound. Meantime, the cerebellum, that's where the smile came when you saw the polar bear. Anterior cingulate area, I love polar bears, they're so cute. Mesoorbital frontal area, that's not a real polar bear. If it was a real polar bear, I'd be out of the room, it's just a picture, and I'm worried about the melting ice pack. So that's how it all works. <laughs> oh, and then, here's what happens. You get a smile. Especially if you're very familiar with polar bears, as this woman obviously must have been. And here's another picture. Okay, and this sort of strikes a chord with us. This resonates with us, even across species. And most important of all, this is the primary function. There's this kind of intuitive grasp. So I've given you some positive things where you feel sort of an instant emotional draw or resonance, if you will, but there are also very negative things. Um, this was a famous photograph and won the Pulitzer Prize of a police chief executing a Viet Cong prisoner in the streets of Saigon in 1968. Um, this was another image in 1972 that won the Pulitzer Prize um, after the bombing of uh, a village in Vietnam with napalm. And you have to ask yourself, why do we respond? Why do we have this part of our brain that's firing in resonance to uh, these images? There's something about the evolution of primates. What this uh, cartoon says is, I don't know how to put this, so I'll just come right out and say it. Mom, Dad, I'm a homo sapiens. There's something about the primate system that is built to uh, have these kinds of ancillary responses throughout the brain. Now, why would that be? If we look at this incredible, one-of-a-kind growth in the uh, brain pan, if you will, of the primate species, it is one of the most remarkable developments that we see uh, in the evolutionary record. It's massive. If I graph this out, it's almost exponential, the cranial capacity. So if we compare, this is a chimp brain um, in comparison uh, next to a human brain, and you look at this growth and say to yourself, this is over a period of just a few million years, this exponential increase in capacity, and large amounts of this capacity seem to be related to these areas of brain that fire with imitation. Now, Aristotle said, the instinct of imitation is implanted in man from childhood. One difference between him and other animal beings, that he is the most imitative of living creatures and through imitation learns his earliest lessons. And I just want you to see, I don't know if I, I just want you to take a look at the exquisite imaging that was done in this uh, mirror painting from the uh, 15th century. It's just really exquisite, the convexity of that uh, mirror. So some have suggested that this increase in cranial capacity may actually have gone hand in glove, so to speak, with this increase in uh, mirror neuron capacity. Now, this is a 72-year-old 72 72 newborn who is responding to his father as part of a research protocol. And as you can see, at 72 hours, literally right out of the box, so to speak, this baby is capable of producing and mimicking facial movement. Um, uh, this is, of course, Jane Goodall, who is aping it up, so to speak, with uh, one of her subjects. Um, and this is a very similar experiment that was done with a series of macaque monkeys, and again, um, very strong imitative capacity. So this is something that's been passed on to us from our primate origins. Um, just lest we think we're uh, the only creatures, this is a seven-day-old chimp uh, in the same experiment. And as you can see, this chimp is doing a very good job of mimicking its uh, not-so-close relative uh, above. Now, why would we have gone to the, uh, the evolutionary work, so to speak, of developing such an exquisite mimicry system? Well, presumably because mimicry is very important in terms of informational content and communication uh, capabilities. This seems to be particularly true amongst siblings, uh, have this unique way of uh, communicating with each other. But something interesting happens uh, even uh, during the early phases of infant development. Early on, as we just saw, children will imitate the facial gestures of their parents, of their caretakers. But within a few months after birth, 
something interesting happens, and that is the baby flips the scenario around, and the baby now is looking, does it smile actually trigger a facial response in its parent. And it is looking for this beginning of facial interactions. And it is cueing off of its mother and its father, uh, caretakers, to see whether or not there are appropriate responses to its facial gestures. Very significant development. The mirror neuron system seems to be an integral part of where we start to build language. Um, there's an interesting story about uh, these uh, macaque monkeys. Um, as some of you may know, there's a, there's a large colony of macaque monkeys off the coast of Japan. Um, and uh, they live by the sea in the mountains that come down to the sea. And the villagers used to believe it was good luck to have the macaque monkeys staying in the vicinity of the village. So in order to ensure that, um, well, Let me see, I'll tell you a story. I'll just, I love to tell stories, so I'll tell you a story about monkeys. Do you know the story about the monkeys in Gibraltar? And uh, there are monkeys in Gibraltar that are also macaques. And um, legend has it that uh, Gibraltar will fall when the monkeys leave Gibraltar, uh, that they will leave the, the hands of the British crown. So during World War II, Gibraltar was vitally important for the Allied to control entrance and exit of the Mediterranean. And so uh, just in case there was any truth to the legend about Gibraltar falling if the monkeys ever left Gibraltar, Winston Churchill had another 200 monkeys brought in and made sure that part of the Army's uh, mission was to feed the monkeys every single day. And to this day, they're fed on the rock of Gibraltar. Um, the story about the macaques was it was considered good luck in Japan to have the macaques near the fishing villages, and it was thought to bring uh, good luck to the fishermen. So in order to entice them, they used the same ploy that Winston Churchill did, and they would leave food on the beach for the macaque monkeys. And most of this food was in the form of rice. Now the problem is when you leave rice on the sand, and then you come along as a macaque to pick it up, what you end up with is a little bit of rice and a lot of sand, and it's not very digestible. And one macaque in particular, a female, figured out that if she could take the handful of sand and rice and walk over to a tidal pool of salt water, and she dropped it into the salt water, what would happen is the rice would fall to the bottom of the pool, and the, rice could, the, uh, the sand would fall to the bottom of the pool, and the rice could be gathered up to be eaten. Now, the interesting thing was the macaques in the troop all learned this new trick by imitation, with one notable exception. Not a single macaque in the troop that was older than that female monkey ever could learn it. It was only the younger macaques that could actually learn how to do this and then pass it on. So clearly, this imitative ability has some unique adaptations for survival. Now, this is Coco, the gorilla who was taught sign language. Now, this is Coco's own made-up symbol for the word stupid. But somehow, it translates for us very, very readily. So, are we the beneficiaries of two unique neuroanatomical systems, basically convergent um, neurobiologic systems, a motor neuron system for the hands and a motor neuron system for the face, and together, hands and face give us the construct for language. Um, one of the issues that's been raised is, is this ability, could this have been passed on, and would there have been some unique advantage to animals that had a higher ability to imitate. And the, in fact, the story I just told you about the macaques would suggest that offspring that have inherited imitative abilities, namely the ability to fire their mirror neuron system watching others, may actually learn better and be able to adapt better. And I want you to think about this for a moment. And uh, I know, how am I going to do this? I'm going to have to adapt. Can you hear me? Because they probably can't. But if I'm hunting with you, and you're a part of my troop, and I'm trying to tell you where we need to go for game, 
that there's a group of antelope or there's a group of deer and it's over the hill and along the river and down through the trees. It's one thing for me to imitate that. It's one very small step for me to actually bend down in the dirt and begin to draw it for you. That's one small anatomic leap, if you will, in imitation. But if you think about it, that is essentially the basis of civilization. That is what culture is about. This small leap of being able to draw and imitate is what we would call art. And the ability to draw and imitate with symbols is what we call literature. And the ability to draw and imitate then takes on the form of something as beautiful as these gorgeous, spectacular drawings in Lascaux, France. And I would contend it's a much smaller step to go to this. This is Gaudi's cathedral in Barcelona, Spain. This is a much smaller leap than this. To get to this, to take what you see in nature and imitate it on the walls of the cave, that has set the stage in terms of imitative ability for everything that comes after it, whether it be this or whether it be this. Now, there's something very interesting happens as well in the terms of context. And this was brought out uh, to me in the uh, lecture that I saw in Integrative Medicine. And that is, these are two pictures. And if you look, there are two meals here. One meal, everything lies in preparation. Another meal, creamers knocked over. You can tell this was a study that was done in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, the creamers knocked over, the teapot's open, the, the pie's been eaten. Now, the gesture of reaching for the cup is the same. But here, you're obviously reaching for the cup to start drinking tea. Here, you're obviously reaching for the cup because it's time to clean up. And when we look, this issue of context has a huge correlation in terms of the firing of the mirror neuron system. The mirror neuron system uses this, remember we were talking about this area in the ventral premotor cortex, it uses this to tell the brain what is the context of reaching for this cup. Is it to go ahead and have a cup of tea or is it to clean up? Even though the gestures are the same. Now why is this important? Here's the same gesture. They have utterly different significance, but it's the same gesture. And it is your brain that is taking this mirror neuron system and then funneling it through the ventral premotor area that is giving it the context of what this means. Now, Ramachandran is a, a very well-known neurobiologist, and this quote of his, I love it, and this is that this imitative cortex is what allows us to create simile. It's what allows us to create metaphor. And he said, any monkey could reach for a peanut, but only a human with an adequately developed mirror neuron system can reach for the stars. It is the ultimate gift. Now, people have raised the whole question of, is this why movies hold so much appeal for us? Why is it that we love to go to the movie theater and whether it be comedy or it be a slasher thriller, we get so caught up in the emotion that's going on on the screen. Is it somehow that we're sort of purposely firing up our mirror neuron system? Um, and this has raised some unique implications with respect to children who watch uh, high levels of violent content. And in fact, what people are beginning to look at imaging studies and what they're seeing is that children who watch an inordinate amount of violent content, whether it be program television or it be game content, actually begin to develop very different firings in areas of the brain that are devoted to anger and rage, such as the amygdala. So it may be that this firing of the mirror neuron system may say a great deal about how we develop as well. Uh, let me give you another example, boxing. If you watch people at a boxing match, one of the things that you'll see around the periphery of the boxing match is you'll see people, they're sitting there you know, weaving and bobbing and throwing punches. It's as if they're in the, in the match themselves. And this is a photograph of a guy who, uh, who was so identified with his boxer that when his favorite boxer knocked out his opponent, 
This guy ran out of the stands and tried to drag his opponent out of the ring so he would be disqualified for the bout. And you can see security here running up and trying. He just has lost all sense of proportion. He's so identified he's in the ring. He's actually going to participate and help his boxer win the match. And uh, if, you, if you look at attendance at uh, athletic events, you'll see that this is a genuine problem of people getting so carried away and so identified with the actual athletes on the field or in the arena um, that they begin to act out. Now, I would propose to you that there is a fundamental developmental leap that occurs here in this mirror neuron system. And that is that in the beginning, this mirror neuron system has to sort out what's happening What's originating for me versus what am I experiencing from others? And then as language begins to develop, you begin to sort out what's me and what's not me. And that leads you to your huge developmental milestone, and that is the ego. That is the ultimate identification of what is from within versus what is from without and that this has got to be one of the major problems as the mirror neuron system develops. And when I see these studies of children struggling to see how much emotion they can bring out in their parents, I begin to wonder how much of this is setting the foundations for our own, uh, our own identification of self. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a leap here. Um, uh, this is uh, Sir Francis Crick. Many of you know won the Nobel Prize along with uh, James Watson and Maurice Wilkins for the identification of uh, DNA. Uh, Crick has proposed that there have been five scientific revolutions. Um, and the first is the Copernican Revolution, uh, the second the Darwinian Revolution, the third the Freudian Revolution, and the fourth the Genetic Revolution, which he was a pioneer in, and the fifth he believes is the neuroscientific one, heralded by the development and the, of the uh, knowledge about the mirror neuron system. And he has actually likened the finding of the mirror neuron system in importance to uh, the uh, laws of gravity supposedly originating with the fall of the apple at uh, Isaac Newton's feet. Now, when you see this image, your mirror neuron system is firing at the points on the face of this boxer where you are visualizing the contact. Um, now, if I show you this, um, the palms of your hands are beginning to fire as you feel this large, tingling spider. Um, but fortunately, I haven't suggested that it's in the middle of the night and it's crawling up the inner thigh under, oh no, but it's too late because now the fire, that part of your brain is firing. But the point is, as I'm moving through these, those parts of your brain are firing as you are literally having the mirror experience suggested by what I'm saying. And the same is true when we look at emotion. We saw earlier um, that I showed you a picture of the anterior cingulate and I showed you how six individuals had very high levels of anterior cingulate area firing and six others had very low areas, low amounts of firing. This ability to feel the pain of others seems to become an inherent characteristic of how our brains may have evolved. If you think about it, it's very important that I be able to feel if somebody is angry with me, is hostile towards me, is feeling sympathetic with me, is feeling attracted to me. Um, those become very important abilities uh, in terms of my ability to survive and get my genes into the next generation. To the extent that we feel emotions like guilt and shame, or pride and embarrassment, admiration and so on, these are all, if you will, reflections of what others see in us. They're all reading what other people feel about us. This ability to feel the pain of others has important implications, not just for our past, but for our present life and our future as well. I'd like, to, um, I'd like to go back for a moment and revisit this issue of uh, mirror neuron system activity and uh, people feeling empathetic versus non-empathetic. Uh, I first want to talk about 
uh, mirror neuron system and what it may tell us about autism. Um, again, this was brought out uh, to me in the lecture on mirror neuron systems and I then looked at some further research and was actually pretty intrigued. Um, if you look at autism, autism is really characterized by a lack of empathy, diminished language skills, lack of facial imitation, and a lack of connection to those around you. I can tell you looking at this, this child on the cover of this magazine does not have autism. This is a model, but this child is making very adequate eye contact. Um, and as you saw by the movie poster, Raymond, uh, again, this issue of a lack of connection with people. If we actually look at autism and we rank the severity of autistic scores on the scale here, and we show autistic children a series of facial uh, photographs, and we look at the amount of firing that is going on in their mirror neuron system with functional imaging, as the severity of your autistic score goes up, the amount of firing in your mirror neuron system goes down. And if we look, and this is just an average of controlled children looking at these pictures versus autistic children, you can see there's a dramatic decrease in the average firing going on in the mirror neuron system. So could autism to some extent be explained by a lack of either genetic or developmental ability to fire the mirror neuron system appropriately? raises an interesting question. The opposite is this syndrome that we call Williams syndrome. And this is a rare genetic syndrome. It's uh, related to a deletion of uh, one gene in the, uh, the sequence that inscribes for, is, uh, for elastin. But the interesting thing is uh, uh, pediatricians love to work with kids with Williams syndrome because they're extremely outgoing. They're very social, they're hyperverbal, they have wonderful social skills. Um, and if they're sort of an interesting counterpart, they're the opposite of autism. They're very connected children, they're very warm. Um, they have an unusual disability, which is they have a, a disability in making adequate constru uh, constructs in terms of parietal lobe function, what we think of typically as parietal lobe function. So this shows you some kids, here's the models they have to uh, reproduce, this shows you the controls down here, and then it shows you uh, some uh, anecdotal drawings from kids with uh, Williams syndrome. But when you look at the firing activity in Williams syndrome compared to controls, you see that in fact they have much higher levels of uh, firing in the mirror neuron system than controls do. And interestingly, there is a slight um, area of uh, decreased uh, uh, development, perhaps, in the parietal lobe to go along with this constructional disability. Now, if altruism is defined as the belief that acting for the benefit of others is right or good, what does this say, perhaps, about the components of the mirror neuron system firing in terms of mirroring the emotions of other people? And is it a natural impulse of ours to do good for others? Or is this just something that we eventually learn how to do? And again, I said earlier, I think that this may have significant implications for not just our own lives, but literally the future of, of our, our, our race. And that is our ability to see what others are suffering um, has important implications as to how we use resources and how we safeguard resources. Our ability to be moved by the plight of others has a great deal to do with how we are going to respond to our fellow neighbor. This is uh, a picture that I find uh, devastating. Um, it's a vulture that's uh, waiting to, uh, for a child to die. Um, this picture was taken by Kevin Carter in 1994. He won the Pulitzer Prize for it eventually when he came back um, from the Sudan he was uh, emotionally devastated and depressed and uh, unfortunately took his life uh, several months before he uh, would go on to win the Pulitzer Prize for his documentation of the suffering in Sudan. The last area of the brain that I wanted to bring to your attention, I don't think it really needs, I'm sure it has your attention, is the nucleus accumbens. That's our pleasure center. Um, it's this area of the brain right here. And, uh, you know that commercial, this is your brain on drugs. Well, this is your brain on sex. Um, the nucleus accumbens fires mightily. Um, now, if you look, this is diminished firing activity. I put this picture here. This is a garbage strike in Milan, not likely to get your nucleus accumbens firing unless you 
happened to be one of the garbage men on strike waiting for it to end. Now, there's an interesting game called Prisoner of War. And in Prisoner of War, the way this computer game works is you actually have to do beneficial acts on behalf of others to get ahead in the game. So you have to save food for others. Um, you have to hold out under interrogation. You can't give others away, uh, and so on. They had an interesting uh, twist on the game. The first thing they did is they had people play the game, and in fact, even though they had to give up a lot of things, they got pleasure in their nuclear incumbents fired when they were playing the game um, with one interesting twist. Halfway through the game, the researchers decided to come out and tell the participants that they found that somebody else playing the game was cheating. That is, that somebody was participating with the guards in the game and taking advantage of all of their sacrifices. Now, the interesting thing is they went on and continued and told them they had to continue to play the game. Interestingly enough, the female subjects in the group went back to playing the game and their nuclear incumbents kept firing even though they knew somebody was cheating in the game. The men who played prisoner of war game, once they learned somebody was cheating, their nuclear incumbents no longer fired. In other words, they no longer got pleasure out of making sacrifices for others if they thought that people were taking advantage of them, which I think only really shows, even with neuroimaging, that women are far more willing to forgive than men are. Now, this raises the bigger question, again, of the Dalai Lama has said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And again, this was one of the things that was brought out for us in these lectures in integrative medicine, that this advice of the Dalai Lama's may not be very far off, neuroanatomically, that if we want to feel good, it would appear that at least a significant subset of us actually experience pleasure when we're doing good or doing altruism for others. Now, this brings us to one of the most important topics, I think, in each of our lives, and that is the object of true love. There must be somebody out there who's our soulmate, for whom our identification with them is so singular that we are feeling everything that they are feeling at the same time and with the same intensity. And there is. <laughs> now, you think I'm joking, but there was a beautiful study that was done where they showed people pictures. And <clears throat> in every one of these pictures, the anterior cingulate area fired, but then the mesioorbital frontal lobe also fired. In other words, there was an emotional reaction to the picture, and at the same time, there was cognitive brakes put on the picture, which is, no, 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 not so fast, this person's scary, or I didn't vote for this person, or whatever. The one picture where only the anterior cingulate area lit up, that is where there was unconditional love, was the picture of the dog. I haven't looked at it, there was an equivalent experiment with cats, but I assume there must be. Um, so literally, Whenever we were firing, this was just pure emotion in the anterior cingulate area, and the mesioorbital frontal lobe is where we put the brakes on it, where we go, yeah, you may love them, but. So is there really nobody in this whole sea of humanity for whom we feel unconditional love? And the answer is, yes, there is. And this is a picture of my wife. And the reason it's in there is I had to give this lecture, and she was in the audience, and I... <laughs> I thought, you're going to just shoot yourself if you don't put it in. But, but it raises the question that you could theoretically ask to have your potential spouse scanned. <laughs> you could flash a number of pictures. So you could put a picture like this of Heidi Klum. And then, you know, I, f I instantly realized you've got to move on before your mesoorbital frontal lobe gets you in trouble. This is a very interesting study that was done at the VA looking at a handful of patients at the VA who were hospitalized for dementia who were artists. And I find this uh, study was brought to my attention and is one of the most uh, moving. Um, this was a one single individual, and this is a picture before his admission to the VA with uh, senile dementia. And this is a picture of the progression of his pictures over a period of about three years to end stage dementia. And what um, I was impressed with, as were the people who were looking at these studies, 
was how these drawings showed human beings gradually being stripped literally of all of their humanity. And it really uh, gave me some insight uh, in a pictorial fashion into the um, kind of isolation that must descend sometimes on uh, people in the throes of, of dementia. This is a, a study that uh, looked at context. This where they showed a videotape of a young man. And uh, <clears throat> before the videotape was shown, they told the story. And in this particular case, the story went something like this, that this was a 16-year-old young man who had lost his girlfriend in a terrible car accident. And then they showed this picture, and then they looked at the firing. And there was a very large, significant amount of empathy that went along with it. If before they showed the picture, they said this was a young man who was arrested for stealing from a blind man in a mall, the level of empathy was completely different. So emotional context has a great deal to do with how we respond in terms of our empathetic response. This is sort of the ultimate empathetic response. This was a series of um, spouses. And uh, let's just use me, because it'll be easier for me to sort of tell you how the method works. I would go in and I would undergo a series of shocks. And these shocks might be stronger or less powerful. And I would rank them from 1 to 10, 10 being excruciatingly uncomfortable, 1 through 10. Now, my wife would be brought into another room where I would observe her, and she would be getting shocks. And I would be told what was the calibration that was being used for the shock administered. Was it a 3 or was it a 9? While this is going on, my hand would be plunged into hot water. And I would be asked how uncomfortable the water was and how much the discomfort I would feel with the water. And here's what would happen. The more significant the stimulus that was being applied to my spouse, that I was watching being applied to my spouse, the more uncomfortable I would rank the hot water that I was feeling with my own hand. So quite literally, the amount of pain that I was experiencing on behalf of others was changing the amount of pain that I myself was experiencing. And as you can imagine, this has profound implications, not only in our own relationships, but particularly within the healthcare professions, where we also are asked sometimes to participate a great deal in the pain of others. The extent to which we experience the pain of others could be our downfall or it could be our supreme moment. When we experience the losses as we are um, right now in the Middle East, it's not very hard to extrapolate that to some of the losses depicted by our great artists that have moved humanity in other contexts. I remember this was a painting that was in the Huntington Hartford Museum right next to where I grew up. My apartment building was half a block from it. And it's a huge painting by Salvador Dali. And it's so immense that you literally have to stand at the feet. And as you look up, you have this sense of this distorted perspective that the artist put here. And because you're standing at the bottom, you have this natural sense of affiliation with Mary as she's looking up at the cross. And this ability for us to identify with the themes of suffering of others, um, I think is one of the most important um, steps, not only in our own development as individuals, but as a species and as countries. So let me see if this will work. Um, this was an interesting study that was done with acupuncturists, and they actually looked at people who are naive to acupuncture versus people who are professional acupuncturists. And then they looked, they showed the movies of people having acupuncture needles inserted. And people who are professional acupuncturists had much lower levels of activation in their human mirror neuron system. And there are studies which show that actually as we progress through training as doctors, we tend to downgrade or downscale and downrate the sufferings that patients are reporting. We tend to sort of say, I know what they're feeling. You believe me, they're not in as much pain as they say they're in. Um, so this is one of the professional hazards of seeing suffering um, uh, in a, on a chronic basis. I don't know if I need to tell you. I'm not sure I can make this run, but I'll try. It doesn't look like, wait. This is a famous Zimbardo Stanford prison experiment. 
Um, what happened was they took the bottom of the basement of the psychology building at Stanford. They took two group, the group of normal college students. They randomly separated them into being guards and prisoners. They went to the elaborate trouble of having the people who were segregated as prisoners arrested. They brought them in. They fingerprinted them. They took their clothes away um, and treated them in every respect as prisoners. The guards, on the other hand, was again, just they were randomly sorted out. But one of the things I think that you'll see very quickly is within a matter of a day, uh, the prisoners started to get that sort of thousand mile stare. Um, they started to get that kind of alienated, disembodied look. And in fact, what happened was within a matter of two days as they watched the videotapes, the guards started becoming more and more physically abusive, punitive. Interestingly enough, one of the things this experiment was done, I think in 1968, um, was they started to make the uh, prisoners embrace each other. Um, not that unlike what happened at Abu Ghraib. And interestingly, Zimbardo, who was the professor nominally in charge of these experiments, began to instantly identify with the guards. And this experiment was brought to an end, not by Zimbardo, but by his wife. After six days, she told him that this had gone too far. And uh, they literally were completely carried away. And so the point of how we feel for people, to some extent, is a reflection of whether or not we can identify with them. And one of the things that became clear in the Stanford prison experiments is that all it took was setting up some arbitrary separation into one population and into another and putting one group and empowering one group over another. And very, very quickly, this divergence in identification with other people started to set in. Um, there's a Captain Gilbert was the psychologist who was assigned to the prisoners of war at Nuremberg trial. And one of the reasons was they were afraid that some of the Nazi war criminals would commit suicide. But he wrote a beautiful book about his experiences. And at the beginning, he says, I told you once that I was searching for the nature of evil. And I now think I've come close to defining it. It's a lack of empathy. It's the one characteristic that connects all the Nazi defendants, a genuine incapacity to feel with fellow man. Evil, I think, is the absence of empathy. So this mirror neuron system seems to be a significant new paradigm in how our brain may work. It may have powerful evolutionary and biologic implications. It seems to be activated under a wide variety of circumstances. It may give us insights into some of these emotional states of connection or disconnection, and it may actually let us define a little bit more about what the nature of evil and good, of altruism and selfishness are. This is sort of the ultimate for uh, psychiatry. This was a study that was done with uh, a group of therapists and their patients who had been together for a long period of time and agreed to a study in which they were videotaped during a therapy session and they measured their skin conductance during the therapy session. Afterwards, they asked both the therapist and the client if they would rank when they felt really empathetic for each other, when they felt that they were most in sync during the therapy session. And interestingly, there's a very high level of concordance between when the client and the therapist reported that they were in sync. And uh, not surprisingly, it was when the therapist wasn't talking. Um, but this shows you um, what they looked at and what they found was that when there was a very high level of reporting of concordance, if you will, of empathy between the client and the therapist, there was also concordance in the skin conduction between the therapist and the client. So literally our autonomic nervous systems seem to connect us. There's been some excellent work that's been done on EKG showing that uh, when we go into a room, uh, we tend to start syncing our, literally our heartbeats uh, to each other within about 10 feet. Um, and I'd like to finish with this example, which I, I think is wonderful, is brought to my attention, was the slime molds. Uh, they're not particularly photogenic, but uh, slime molds have an interesting uh, uh, activity. When there's abundant food, uh, the slime molds uh, just sort of overrun the surface that they're plated on. In this case, it's a maze. But, and they'll look like this. But when there's a shortage of food, when there's only food at one end of the maze, the slime molds unite. And they become one coherent organism in order 
to solve the shortage of food. So it would seem that this ability to interact and mirror with each other and feel for each other is certainly not limited to just primates. We may have something to learn from uh, the slime mold. I want to touch on this because I think this issue of emotional connection and transformation is important. This is James Newton. James Newton was a, a sea captain and a slave trader. And uh, he was uh, very active in the slave trade between Africa and the Caribbean. And one night, he was taking a hold full of, uh, of captured Africans in the belly of his ship, and they were caught in a terrible storm. And he was convinced that they would all perish that night. And as he was contemplating his plight, he realized that there was no difference between what was going to happen to him and what was going to happen to the men and women who were chained in the hold of the ship below. And uh, he swore that if uh, God would allow him to live through the night, that he would change his ways. And uh, he was allowed to live through the night. He went on to write the hymn Amazing Grace, um, and he turned the ship around in the morning and headed back to Africa and released the captives and went on to become an a ordained minister and became the foremost abolitionist of his time. So this issue of identification, this issue of how personal the plight of others is with regards to our own, um, is not something that's preordained. It is something that can change. And it is give us reason for hope uh, that we can be different uh, if we choose to be. So I want to thank you. Um, we all have the capacity maybe to reflect one day um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's emotions. So thank you very much. I'll take any questions. I would like to say I'm going to give you, there's a disc that I'm going to, if you want, that I'll download. But I also want to give you some references because uh, I would very much like you to know about the work that was presented at the Grand Rounds in Integrative Medicine as well. Because that's where I drew my inspiration from. Yes? Thank you, Adam. Excellent. Thank you. Superb, really. Thank you. Inspiring and exciting. Many questions arise. I ask one. Has anybody looked at neuronal activity, mirror neuron activity? in criminal psychopaths? Um, you know, it's an interesting, uh, I, I went to a, a lecture that was given by the foremost brain imaging expert on, uh, on criminals. He did uh, Sirhan Sirhan, um, he'd done a number of famous serial killers. Um, and he asked me, uh, this audience that we were in, he asked an interesting question. He said, how many of you in the audience believe that um, how you're destined to be is determined um, by your, where you're brought up, what your parents expose you to, the household, whether your school's a good school, uh, how cultured you are, how educated. And I'd say one third of the audience put their hands up and he said, you must all be the parents of a single child. And he said, how many of you would believe that genetics makes up all the difference and there's no explaining how people turn out and the rest of the audience, and he said, you must have more than one child. The answer is uh, that there are no studies yet that because there just is no agreement on how you would segregate this issue of a sociopath and based on what criteria. So the only studies that I have seen have been some interesting studies on religion and uh, looking at the incidence, for example, of temporal lobe epilepsy and hyper-religious states. And there, what you see is that there really is no prediction looking at the imaging study of identical twins as to who is going to uh, develop this hyper-religiosity and this firing in the temporal lobe that you can sometimes see. That's as close as I've gotten, but yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. behavior in the mirroring and that jump to empathy and looking at cult sociopaths you have Nuremberg up there I mean mm -hmm. these people are identified and I'm looking at where where does moral where do morals come into this because it's just not context that comes in and refines that 
uh, that emotional piece. There's, there's some moral context here as well in terms of empathy, because they may empathize with each other, but they're not empathizing with another group. So how does that all get explained? That's a confusing way of asking. Right. I, I, I think it's a very interesting question.